Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on <laughs> where everyone is. Uh, so happy to be learning together uh, today. Uh, this, this is uh, the third class and, and the final class in uh, Repeals of Repentance, uh, Spiritual Dimensions of Tashlich with Rav Matthew Nitanim. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to those who are uh, joining us now. I'll be sending you an invitation to uh, become a panelist. That would allow you to uh, participate verbally in class and unmute um, if you choose to. Uh, it would also allow you, um, if you are able, to uh, turn on your uh, video so we can see you. You don't have to, but it would be nice. Um, you can feel free to engage uh, with us uh, also via chat um, here on Zoom. Um, as a comment while well, once we're uh, live on Facebook, if we can uh, do this today. And uh, just uh, just a reminder, when you're not speaking, uh, please uh, keep yourself muted and then I'll help uh, to mute you as well if you forget. And then whenever you'd like to uh, speak again, just uh, remember to unmute so we can hear you. And uh, with that, I'll turn this to you, Rav Matthew. Amazing. Thanks so much uh, to Evie and to really everyone that was involved in uh, bringing this class uh, to life. Um, and a pleasure to be with all of you uh, for our third installment of our exploration of, uh, of Tashlich. When, um, when we started uh, a couple of weeks ago, two weeks back, so we looked at the, the biblical language um, that's uh, a part of the, that sort of forms the, the core of the ritual of Tashlich and the kind of imagery that that uh, evokes around what is sin, um, the idea of sin as a, a burden, um, a, a particular metaphor for sin and the, the spiritual implications of that, what it means to see sin as the kind of thing that you carry around as opposed to, say, the rabbinic metaphor of um, sin as a, a debt. Um, so that's what we looked at our first week. And, and then last week, we sort of pivoted and talked about um, alternate ways of thinking about Tashli, um, especially amongst later rabbinic thinkers, um, especially those who were a little bit uncomfortable with the Something about the tossing the sins into the water that they were sort of uncomfortable with, um, and these alternate possibilities of what Tashlich might be. In particular, um, trying to imagine what significance there might be to praying alongside the water on Rosh Hashanah. What significance the the water side prayer might have. But now we really have to get to the crux of what is up with this thing, where once a year Jews make their way to bodies of water and start tossing sins bread. Uh, over into uh, into the water. What, where does that come from, uh, and what what might we make of it? Um, so that's so today we're really going to look at the the more uncomfortable part of Tashlich, I suppose. Um, certainly uncomfortable for quite a many rabbinic figures, uh, and we'll have to we'll have to see how it came to be and what what that means for us. Um, so let's uh, let's let's see where the story starts uh, in the text, even though. As is often the case in, when thinking about Jewish practice, and especially around Min Hagim, uh, the story doesn't really start with the text. Uh, oftentimes we have practices, especially in the Min Hag category, that emerge from within communities, from within people's practice, and only later do the rabbis take note and start to write, write, write about it. And so oftentimes when we're looking at text around Min Hagim, we have to work under the presumption that the, the practice already pre-exists the textual evidence, and then we have to figure out what are the texts adding in or what perspective are they offering, but again, on the presumption that the, the practice already exists. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to start by looking at the, the first uh, clear record uh, in rabbinic writing of the ritual that we refer to as Tashlich. Um, the truth is the, the first record that we have of something that's similar to Tashlich, actually appears in the commentary of Rashi, uh, in his commentary on the Talmud. Uh, so we're talking really the, the beginning of the, of, the, of the previous millennium, uh, when Rashi is writing, and where um, he mentions this practice, he, in the context of the Gemara and Shabbat, where he talks about a particular kind of um, pot uh, that was used as, as a planter for uh, like growing small plants at home, and he mentions this tradition where um, Families would take their young children sometime around, sometime before Rosh Hashanah, they would grow these plants and then they would wave them around their children's heads, say, your sins are transferred onto this plant, and then they would take the plant and toss it into the water. 
And so it seems to me that Rashi is familiar with some sort of Tashlich Kaparot combo um, that is no longer maintained, but it seems to be that Tashlich is in some ways connected to the tradition of Kaparot. And we'll see why that's significant as we go ahead. But in terms of Tashlich as we know it, a tradition specifically Rosh Hashanah, specifically going to the water with some bread, tossing it in. The first reference that we have is um, from the Maharil. The Maharil lives um, uh, at the, the end of the 13 and into the 1400s. Um, so we can presume that his his major work is written sometime around, let's say, the year 1400. Um, and the Maharil, uh, Maharil writes as follows. Amar Mahari Sega. So this is a, where this is a record of the opinions of, uh, that were of the Maharil that were written down. So regarding this practice, again, this is the first time we see this written down in rabbinic writing, that there are those have the, the practice of going on Rosh Hashanah after the meal, they walk down to the water, to the the, Aminunaro, the lakes and the and the rivers, to throw to throw their sins into the into the depths of the water, which is already a reference to the Pasuk. That uh, from the book of Micha that is ref- that's recited as part of uh, Tashdeh, as we discussed before. So he's trying to figure out where does this come. He suggests as follows: Mishum diita b'midrash zecher la'akida she'avar Avraham Avinu banahar ad tavaro v'amar u'shia Hashem kivau ma'im ad nafesh. This is a, a commemoration of the akida, right? The story of the binding of Isaac when, when Abraham uh, binds Yitzchak and nearly sacrifices him until uh, until God by the angel says to to hold back. And because of this midrash that says that on the way to the Akedah, Abraham got stopped by, had to pass through a river, and the water came all up to his neck, and he prayed to God. Vehu, continuing this last sentence, Vehu asatashan asak monahar la min Akedah. And this wasn't just any river, it was actually Satan, the Satan, who had turned into a river in order to preclude Abraham from performing the Akedah. So says the Ma'aril, the reason why we do Tashlid is as a commemoration of this moment prior to the Akedah when Abraham passes through the Satanic River and calls out to God. So in a moment, I want to look at the Midrash, which um, the Ma'aril is, is uh, citing here. But already from the outset, we should notice that it seems hard to believe that this is really the origin of Tashlid. And that's because if it is true that we uh, try to commemorate the Akedah uh, as part of our uh, uh, ritual uh, experience on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the Akedah is mentioned in the Tfilot, uh, in uh, in the in the section of Zichronot on Rosh Hashanah. Um, there's a notion that the the shofar might have some sort of connection with Akedah. We read the, the story of the Akedah on Rosh Hashanah from the Torah. So it could be that there's some sort of Akedah connection to Rosh Hashanah. The challenge is, one, we already have some ways of calling our our attention to the story of the Akedah and Rosh Hashanah. We read that we read it from it's the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. It gets mentioned in the central tefillot. Why would we add in this extra thing to remember the Akedah? It seems a little bit unnecessary. And number two, if we wanted to have some sort of ritual where we stage uh, some element of the Akedah, it's hard to imagine why we would specifically choose the part that isn't even stated in the Torah. Is just this. Thing that shows up in the Midrash where the Satan turned into water and so we go to water. It doesn't really explain how, why of all elements of Akedah, this is the one that we wanted to commemorate. Not to mention the fact that if the, as we mentioned last time, there were some rabbinic thinkers who chose to frame the Akedah, I'm sorry, frame, frame Tashlit as a prayer that's said by the water. But the Maharil seems to notice that the practice is to cast sins into the sea, cast some sort of bread or something, and it's significant that he mentions that people go after the meal, seemingly they bring the breadcrumbs or the leftovers along with them. So the Maharil is aware of the bread throwing part, and yet he says that the, the reason for this tradition has nothing to do with throwing anything. It's just about being alongside the water. So it's hard to believe that Maharil is really giving us an honest account of what's going on here. Now, it's also significant to note that the Maharil, uh, in the continuation of this section, already, this is the first rabbinic text about Tashik, and he's already criticizing the practice. And he, he notes that he's a little frustrated that all these Jews are throwing bread into the water because there's a there's a technicality where it's not so clear that um, bread can be um, thrown into the water 
into the fish, uh, towards the fish on, on Yom Tov, um, certainly on Shabbat, but maybe even on Yom Tov, there might be a concern around Mukta. Um, and he and he says, and even to have a, a non-Jew just conveniently show up with bread is a problem, which leads to, to suggest to wonder whether people, despite rabbinic uh, disapproval, were trying to find ways to get their bread to the water. So it sounds like the Mariel's explanation is not, it doesn't sound like he's giving us an honest account of what's going on in Tashla. And yet, his story is an important one because it might lead us towards an understanding of the origins of Tashlif. Let's start by, um, by looking at the Midrash, which the Maharil mentions. The Midrash comes from um, the work, the Midrash Tanchuma, um, one of the classical works of Midrash, where um, the we're talking, we're in Parsha Vayra, we're, uh, we're, we're addressing the, the story of the Akidah, of the Binding of Isaac, um, and the story goes as follows. By Mashlishi, we're on the on the third day, right? We it, it's noted in the Torah that it takes three days for Abraham to get um, from where he leaves from, presumably in the area of Hebron, until he makes it to Har Moriah, presumably in Jerusalem, which is puzzling because if you're walking, it shouldn't take more than a day. And so the Midrash wonders why did it take so long? And so the Midrash continues. Why did it take three whole days? When it should have just taken uh, probably a day or no more. So claims the midrash that when the Satan saw that uh, that Abraham was insisting on going to, to perform the akedah, the Satan, the Satan, turned into a great river, a mighty river. So it says in the Midrash that Avram goes into the water, it reaches, the water gets to his knees, he says, we're going to keep going, and he gets to the middle of the river, and the water is all the way up to his neck. And now he's stuck. What does he do now? At that moment, Avram looks up towards the heavens, Amarafanav and says to God, You have you have chosen me, you have appeared to me. You God have told have told me that it is through me that that your name, God's name, shall be known throughout the world. I have this, I have a task in the world. And you, God, have asked of me to sacrifice my child, Yitzchak, but Lo and I, I did not hold back. And I'm, I'm doing what you've asked of me. Now the waters have reached the soul. This is a reference to a, a Pasuk in Tehilim, um, chapter 69, um, Save, O Lord, for the waters have reached the soul. Um, meaning the in, in the biblical imagery, presumably that means the waters all are reaching up to the point where the, 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 the neck or the mouth where we breathe from. And so our, the, one's life is at risk. The, the waters are reached the point where one's life is at risk. So it says, Ya Abraham, Abraham says, when Abraham says that he's afraid, what he's afraid of is not having the opportunity to perform the Akedah. Um, God says, certainly um, I will ensure that you uh, can fulfill your role of uh, of making of declaring the unity of, of my name in the world. At that moment, God rebukes the water, who is, as we said, um, the Satan in river form, and suddenly it gets dried up and they're on dry land. Okay, an unusual story. An unusual story. Um, and it leads us to wonder what what is the Satan doing? In the Akedah story, why why did we need the Satan to show up? Now it is it's fitting for Satan's, I suppose, um, in traditional uh, in traditional stories that the role of the Satan is to preclude us from do engaging in the worship of God. All right, we have these goals that we're going to uh, fulfill mitzvot or do what God has asked of us, and the role of Satan is to step in this whoever this satanic demonic figure is and get in our way. And we have this fear of Satan getting in the way. And so 
the Satan shows up to try to stop Abraham, and it is part of the, the greatness, the courageousness of Abraham, that Abraham stands up to the Satan um, and insists on going ahead with the, with the Akedah. And at the same time, there's also something really interesting about this, this moment of crisis that Abraham faces in anticipation of the Akedah. He's about to seemingly sacrifice his son, and, and he, he suddenly finds us on the water, and he's, and he's, he's facing this moment of desperation and turns to God for help. That too might be part of the story here. And so what I think we're going to have to do to figure out what is happening in, in, in Tashlif, where the Maharil directs us towards the story about the Akidah and the Satan is maybe, maybe the Satan is a part of the story. Maybe in fact, the Satan is a part of a lot of the story of the High Holidays, especially around Tashlif. And for this, we're going to have to get some help from a scholar by the name of Tzvi Lauterbach. Lauterbach um, taught at HUC in the 1920s and 30s and wrote a, a, a paper, I believe, in 1936 um, on the, the historical development of Tashlif. It's uh, considered sort of the, the go-to comprehensive work on, on Tashlif. Um, before preparing, work, starting to work on this shiur, I, I, on this, uh, this series, I figured it's important that I should read Lauterbach. I'd heard of the piece. And... I figured, you know, I'll read a paper. How long could it be? You know, 20, 30 pages. The man found 140 pages to write about Tashlich. Um, really an accomplishment. Um, he should have been kind enough to let us know it's a book. Uh, but it's uh, it's really an interesting work and much of the much of the direction that we'll explore today um, is taken from, from Lauterbach's work. Um, Lauterbach directs us to another part of the High Holidays. When we think about, uh, as, I, as I mentioned when we spoke last time, there's it's very something funny about the fact that we're having class about Tashlich already after Rosh Hashanah, but there is, are some clear times to Yom Kippur. Um, uh, and we already mentioned the connection to Kaparot, but the latter back directs us towards um, the temple service on Yom Kippur, the worship of the, 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 the special sacrificial rite that was observed in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple on, on Yom Kippur, and he thinks that it might play a role in how we understand what's happening in Tashlich. And so we'll, we'll take a look together at um, the commentary of the Ramban um, uh, on, on the verses in Vayikra, which describe the, the element of the ritual called the Seir Azazel. The Seir Azazel we generally refer to as the scapegoat, and it is in fact the goat that takes upon all of our sins, or we the Kohen Gadol um, takes on the sins of the Jewish people and lays them all onto this goat. And then the goat is sent La Azazel. Hard to know what Azazel means. Um, uh, it's supposed to go out to an Eretz Gzeira and to some sort of desert. The mission describes the, the tumbling of the goat down the cliff. Um, but Azazel is a funny word. And usually names that have L at the end, L means God, right, in the name like Yisrael, Michael, and so there's, or in, in, in later um, uh, uh, early Jewish mystical writing, angels are all, you know, with L at the end, so there could be some sort of deity name going on, and an A's is a goat. So there's some sort of goat deity figure, maybe? Who is Azazel? Who is Azazel? The Ramban offers a possibility of what's going on, um, uh, which will have will might might catch us a little bit by surprise, but um, we'll have to we'll have to take it for one. The Ramban says as follows: Mufurash Mizel and Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer Gadol. Um, Ramban references a, a work called Pirkei um, Pirke de Rabbi Eliezer, which is a midrashic work um, from around I believe the eighth or ninth century. We think um, a peculiar work of midrash um, with very few connections to other works of uh, rabbinic midrash. Um, which says as follows: The fichach hayu notzmin lo v'samael shochad the yom kippurim shelo levatod korbana shemar gral chala shem gral chala azazel. The pirkei of the other claims that the goal of the seir la azazel, this goat, the 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 the, 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 the sin offering, it's up the goat um, that was brought that was sent out to the desert, is a bribe to samael. Samael is also another name that's used in rabbinic literature to refer to. Something like Satan, some sort of demon character. Um, some are referring to the fact that the, the, the Satan was considered someone blind that was easily confused. 
um, and hence can be bribed. So apparently the, the scapegoat was actually a bribe to Satan. Okay. And you may ask, is it okay to offer a sacrificial bribe to Satan? Is that is that a thing we do? The Ramban goes on. It can't be. The, the Torah forbids worshiping uh, any deity, any sort of being or creature other than God. So how could it be that we're worshiping, we're sending a sacrifice off to Samael, off to Satan? Aval, says the Ramban, Aval tziva kash barakol b'yom ha-kippurim, sh'nishlach se'ir b'mibar l'asar ha-moshel b'mkomot ha-churban. But God commanded us on Yom Kippur to send a goat off to the desert to the deity, the Sar, who reigns over the barren places, the Huara Uila. And it's, it's fitting to do so. Because this character, Samael, runs the show over there. He's the, the owner, the master of these barren areas. Um, and is out of the strength of this character that destruction happens in the world. Because this character, Samael, Satan, is the one who controls the constellations up in the sky, thinking a little bit astrologically, um, that brings about warfare, bloodshed, quarrels, all the horrible things that happen in the world. That That character makes all that happen. And so we need to Offer a, a bribe. After the ellipses, Raman says, obviously it's not a, a korban, a sacrifice to Satan. We're simply fulfilling the will of God who commanded us to give this bribe to Satan. It's a really unusual thing that Ramban is suggesting. Um, and he's building, th this idea is reported in uh, in the Zohar and a few other uh, re relatively early um, uh, pieces of rabbinic writing, that there's something going on where on Yom Kippur, as part of the, the service, we we offer a bribe to Satan, to Satan, because we're afraid that Satan is going to get in the way of our worship on on uh, on Yom Kippur, on our, it, we, Satan is going to get in the way of our attempts to earn ourselves atonement because satan is always causing trouble and so we need to bribe satan into keeping quiet and that is the seer it could be says Lauterbach, that this notion of trying to bribe the satan into keeping quiet when we're trying to earn ourselves atonement and forgiveness is really in the background of tashlik and that maybe the little breadcrumbs that we're tossing into the water are not just us symbolically throwing sins on the water, but really we too are trying to bribe the Satan. We're trying to, on the presumption, says Lauterbach, that there were ancient traditions that thought that, that the Satan lives somewhere down in the sea, down in the watery places, in the depths. And that really this is, uh, this is what's happening in the background. This is what Tasha is about. We're trying to bribe Satan to keep quiet so we can earn atonement. The truth is, we have evidence for the fact that Jews thought something along these lines. Um, in Addison's work, The Present State of the Jews, um, written in, uh, uh, which is, uh, came out in 1675, um, Addison was uh, spent some time just hanging out with some Jews, uh, primarily, as he says, in Barbary, um, and just wanted to write down what are the things that they do? What, what does Judaism look like? And it's a really interesting account of um, a popular account of Judaism. We often um, only get to see what what rabbis tell us Judaism is, what scholars say. Um, but here we have a work where um, he just at, went around asking Jews, like, "Hey, what what do you do in your Judaism?" Um, and here's the here's the description uh, that he gets for Tashlif. The Jews have had a custom on this day to run into the rivers. I apologize for the somewhat antiquated spelling here, uh, and there to shake off their sins. That according to uh, Micha seven nineteen, which is the pasuk cited in Tashlif. They may be carried into the depths of the sea. If at this lustration they have the good fortune to see a fish, they shake themselves lustily on purpose to load it with their sins, that it may swim away with them and be as the scapegoat of, scapegoat of old. Uh, the emphasis uh, is mine. 
which carry the people's sins into the desert. Some among them would have this repairing to the running water to be in memory of Abraham's being led by an evil spirit into a river when he went to sacrifice his son, where being in great danger of drowning, he prayed unto God, and the river upon the sudden became dry land. So Addison knows that there's this, this thing about, about the Satan and the water, which the Maharil mentioned, but he notes that there's also this queer connection to the scapegoat, to the Seir Lazazel. And apparently, and apparently um, uh, this, I believe, is still practiced for many years by Kurdish Jews as well, that Tasha was not just a matter of throwing bread into the sea, but you actually jump yourself into the water to make sure that the, the fish can eat up the, your sins and take, your, take the sins down to the depths, um, maybe, maybe to Satan. Again, here, here Addison puts a few pieces together. He notes that they thought of the, the Tashlik ritual as being like the scapegoat, where you load your sins onto the fish and the fish take it away. But he also is aware of there's something in the background about the Satan story, which is also kind of relevant. Uh, I'm sorry, kind of related. Um, which is what leads Lauterbach to suggest that maybe in the background there's some sort of vestige of this idea that um, the the scapegoat and Tashik are really shared in this idea of trying to appease Satan, to get Satan not to uh, get in the way of our of our uh, uh, attempts to earn our self forgiveness. Now, when we think about uh, when we think about the high holidays, we think about um, this this time of year. Um, there are um, there are some other appearances of Satan. Uh, Satan uh, shows up in a few other places around the holidays. Um, most prominently, uh, I see some people. Not everyone's uh, on a you know, not everyone's hooked up to the the Zoom in such a way they can they can share. So I won't uh, I won't call in the crowd. But well, uh, the the key. Um, the key example, uh, perhaps, is uh, where we see Satan in the High Holidays is probably the Shofar. Right, we're told that we sound the Shofar in Rosh Hashanah. Um, we're told in both in the Bavli and the Roshami in order to confuse the Satan. There's something that Satan shows up around this time of year, and we get very anxious about. It. And um, and the the sound of the Shofar is, and or the the repeated sound of the Shofar is somehow meant to confuse Satan and. Even a number of the traditions around the sounding of the shofar are connected to the this confusion of Satan. It's suggested that that's why we start blowing the shofar already early in Elul. It's why we don't announce that we don't say Birkala Chodesh. We don't announce that Tishrei is coming. Um, we uh, there's a the notion of covering the shofar um, when on on Rosh Hashanah when it's not being blown, so the, the Satan won't notice it. There's this funny thing where we keep trying to confuse the Satan on Rosh Hashanah with the shofar. And that too might be related. There's this, there's this fear, there's this ancient anxiety that Satan, this demonic character, is going to get in the way of our earning atonement. If we, uh, even if we um, go ahead uh, in the sources, um, here, there we go. Um, if we look, if you open up your mahzor, you can't escape Satan. Right. If we look at the the verses that are recited as the introduction to the sound of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, um, which open with Mina Mitzar, take a close look um, at those verses we recite, and the acrostic that's spelled with these verses is Kira Satan, destroy Satan. Right. Before we sound the shofar, we ask God in this very cryptic way, please overtake Satan. We don't want Satan to get in the way of our sounding of the shofar. By a similar token, uh, elsewhere in our Yom Kippur davening, the Satan shows up in the Hinnani prayer, which the the Chazan, the Cantor, the the leader of the of the, of the Tfilot, um says at uh, before Musa, the the Chazan says, "V'tigar b'Satan levayas dinini." God, please control Satan, rebuke Satan, so that Satan can't get in the way, can't uh, impinge on my prayer, can't. Uh, stop our prayers from getting up to to the heavens similarly in the in the lead up to the kiddusha on musaf of yom kippur mastin bechevel esor mastin there and um, though it's spelled with a samach is also a reference to satan and we ask god take a kevel a kevel a, a kevel uh, some sort of um a rope or chain and esor <laughs> excuse me tie up the satan god tie up satan Hold the Satan in place so the Satan can't run around, 
getting us in trouble. Throughout our liturgy and throughout these various rituals of the high holidays, we see Satan show up. And Lauterbach seems to think that that really is the origin of Tashlich. We have these traditions about this fear that Satan will get in the way of our earning uh, divine atonement. And so we need to eat, pray to God to overtake Satan. We need to confuse Satan. We might even need to appease Satan. Now, if in fact the origin of Tashlich is this tradition of trying to appease Satan, right? First of all, if it's meant to emulate the scapegoat, the Seir Lazazel, well, that itself is a problem because we're not meant to engage in sacrificial rituals outside of the temple. And once we see the Ramban, even that original sacrifice was a little bit suspect. And here we're doing this further version of it. It shouldn't surprise us that if the origins of this practice is this, this fear of Satan, of this demonic figure who sounds so clear we're really supposed to believe in and so that we shouldn't be worshiping, it shouldn't surprise us that rabbis don't love Tashlich. And Lauterbach claims that this is really why rabbis find all these alternate versions, as we saw last week. Well, last week we saw all, all these alternate. Tashlich is really about a coronation. Tashlich is really about witnessing the creation and the waters and whatnot. Um, and similarly, all these halacha considerations, which, as I mentioned, Maharil is, again, the first rabbi to mention. Tashlich already says, but be careful with the bread because... It might be muktza. You might be carrying it outside of the out of the Arab or out of the tomb. When rabbis start raising these sort of tangential Shabbat concerns, it shouldn't surprise us if really in the background there's actually a very deep theological concern that they have, but they don't even want to admit that that's what's going on. This is what how Lauterbach um, says we we are we ought to be reading the Maharil and the other writers were uh, talking about Tashlich. He suggests Maharil and the Ramah and the Lavush and all these rabbis talking about Tashlich, they all know that what the Jews think is happening is that we are casting our sins into the sea scapegoat style and maybe even trying to get our sins to make it down to the Satan. To or some sort of or otherwise like to or or we're sending like a like a gift package to Satan to like you know keep at bay. And the rabbis don't like that because they don't really believe in that conception of Satan, of, of the demon. They believe that God runs the show, that we should be beholden to God. And we shouldn't be worried about all these like little, you know, other figures getting in the way. And when they raise these technical Shabbat concerns that say, okay, so maybe don't throw the bread. What they're really saying is not, I have this concern about the technicalities of Shabbat. What they're really trying to get at is there's something wrong with this ritual, but I'm not going to convince anybody to stop doing it entirely. So let's at least adjust and reframe. Let's adjust the details where we get rid of the bread part. And let's reframe it so that's really about something else. Lauterbach even suggests that, um, right, when we even look at the, the imagery and from this, uh, this woodcut um, from the art of the 1500s, we see there's this notion that you're supposed to shake out your pockets. Why do you have to shake? Why does the bread need to be in your pockets? Why, why can't you just have some bread and toss it into the water? And Lauterbach suggests that it could be that the rabbi said, hey, everyone, stop throwing bread in the water. At face value, maybe that was a Shabbat concern or a Yom Tov concern, but really deep down it was, the rabbis were very uncomfortable with this whole ritual, but the Jews wanted to keep doing it. And so the Jews would do it discreetly. And that's why the Jews would get up after lunch, have some crumbs hiding in their pockets, and then, you know, go on a little stroll down to the water and, oops, some crumbs fell in the water. It's possible there's actually been like a, a give and take between rabbis and the Jews for quite a long time about what Tashlich is and how it's supposed to go. Um, and some Jews tried to keep it under wraps, and that's where the pockets thing came from. It, it came from. It's interesting that in the rabbinic writing, no one mentions the pockets. But in our uh, in the historical record, in some of the um, artistic renditions, we see the shaking out of the, the hens, the pockets. It sounds like the this might be the, some of the Jews trying to get around the rabbinic critique of Tashlich. Okay, so now we have Lauterbach's argument. The origins of Tashlich are can, themselves connected to the scapegoat. Then the origins of the scapegoat are the desire to appease Satan, to get Satan not to get in the way of our earning atonement. What do we do with that? I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know everybody who's here on the. On the on the on the shiur, 
you know, a great many people on this viewer, but I don't know everyone. Um, so I don't know everyone's beliefs about uh, about Satan or demons, but it certainly seems like it's worth asking the question. If one was say, I'll speak for myself. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a strong believer. I would say in um, in Satan. I I'm I'm skeptical about the the possibility that there are all these little demons that are running around wreaking havoc upon the world. If that's so, then then what do we do with all this? What what is the meaning of not only this ritual but all these rituals that we have? The shofar and maybe kaparot or the shofar before shanan the tash the all these different pieces that are end up being sort of tracing their way back to something with Satan, something with Satan. What, what do we do with that? What, what meaning, if any, might it have for? It? I want to suggest maybe two possibilities. Again, acknowledging that for some people, you, we could just be afraid of Satan. It's an option. But if that's not where we're coming from as we approach the high holidays, uh, so then what, what might this all, all be about, certainly for us? Resolution number one, which is um, referenced by uh, a handful of characters, um, the Rama and others, in trying to make sense of this ritual and others, is uh, a line that appears in the Gemara and the Bavli. Um, hu Satan, hu Yitzhara. The Satan is the same thing as the evil inclination. That, what the line means in its original context is uh, worthy of debate, but Later rabbinic thinkers, especially those who had a hard time with demons and so on, um, oftentimes would try to take any reference to Satan in Midrash literature, would say it's all just a metaphor for the Yitzhara, for the evil inclination, for the desires we have in, in, within us that will lead us towards sinful behavior. And so all this talk of Satan isn't really about trying to <laughs> ward off some sort of evil demigod. It's really about our fears of the Yitzhahara, that there are these, these there's a, a spirit, so to speak, within us. There are, we have these, these tendencies within us, these desires within us that might lead us towards the wrong kinds of behavior. And we're trying to, we want to wage a war against that. We want to, want to get the Yitzhahara to be vanquished by the Yitzhahara, too, by the good inclination. And so one way that we could frame all of this is by thinking of the Satan in all these sources and this, in these rituals as really as, as the Sahara, as a metaphor for our own trying to overcome our, the things within us that lead us astray. That's one option. The second, and here we come back to uh, the, the line which opened this class, Hoshesh em kivau maim nafesh, because the waters have reached the soul, which was the line that um, Abraham was supposed to have said when he was standing there in the satanic river, when he gets stuck. And the truth is, and now we can go back, someone else says that line um, in the Midrash. Someone else, we have a story who, of someone who goes, jumps into the water, gets stuck, um, and calls out to God. And that is the story of Nachshon, the story of Nachshon ben Aminadab. Um, this doesn't appear in the Torah itself, but it's in Midrash that appears in the Gemara and the Bafi, where we are told that as the Jews are standing at the at the Yamsuf, at the Red Sea, and they they don't know what's going to happen, are the Egyptians going to drive them into the sea? Nachshon ben Amadav, who is the the leader of the tribe of, of Yehuda, of Judah, says, "You know what? We're going in. We're going to the water, and we'll see what happens." And he jumps in the water to see what happens, and he also, as we're told. Goes all the way up to the point where he's in, in the water's up to his neck. There's no further he can go. And now he's stuck. And this moment he's stuck and there's nowhere else to go, he says these words from, from Tehilim, Hushini Elohim ki vau maim adnafesh. Save me, for the waters have come even unto the soul. There's something about this imagery that I think we're trying to tap into. Ki vau maim adnafesh, that the waters are approaching the soul that we're identifying in the Nachshon story, that we're identifying in the Avraham story, that maybe is a part of all these rituals. Let's take a look at the verses in Tehidim. Hushiyei Elohim, ki uvao maim ad nafesh, tava'ati bivin mitzula ve'in ma'omad, bati v'ma'amakei maim v'shibol she'tafatni, 
יגעתי וקוראי, ניחר גרעוני, כלו עיניי, מייחל לאלוהי. From the JPS 1975. Deliver me, O God, for the waters have reached my neck. Nefesh here again can mean either soul or neck, because the neck is the, where, the, where our, our, the breathing tube would be, where the, the, our, our windpipes are. I'm sinking into the slimy deep and find no foothold. I have come into the watery depths. The flood sweeps me away. I'm weary with calling. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for God. The language that's used here in Tehillim, the, the psalmist goes on to talk about this fear of enemies, this fear of failure. It seems to be the water here is a metaphor, but it's a very powerful metaphor. The metaphor that's being used here is of someone who is facing a real moment of desperation, a real moment of crisis, and feels it is as though I'm caught up in the water and there's nowhere else to go, and I'm, I'm slipping away. The certainly in the ancient world, when people had a little more, uh, at, more people on average had access to um, bodies of water as a, a part of their lives, um, though it's still true for many people uh, on earth today, the water is a really scary place. There's some nice things about it, but it, the, wa the water is dangerous. And when we think about the, the experience of crisis, that, that fear of being overtaken by the water was, a, was an important metaphor that would have been familiar to uh to the the audience the original audience of Tehillim and to others as well and so when we think about all these traditions around satan and the this fear of satan overtaking us this fear of, of satan getting in the way maybe deep down what we're getting at is not even something about demons what we're talking about is our fears or satan maybe is reflective of not the itzahara but satan is all these forces that might get in our way Satan is everything that goes wrong. Satan is all the things that we're afraid of. And when we go down to the water, we go to the, this place of crisis, and we say, Save us, God, for the waters have reached the soul. What we're saying with all these rituals, we keep trying to, we're trying to confuse the Satan and appease the Satan, and what we're really trying to get at is, we're saying to God that we're very much afraid. That there are all these forces in nature, in our lives, that seem to try to get in the way. Maybe those forces are external to us, things like earthquakes or disease, maybe things that reside within us, um, all sorts of anxieties that we might hold, and they, and they stand in the way of the things that we'd like to accomplish, that we'd like to accomplish in our own lives, that we'd like to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with God. There are these things, these demons, maybe internal demons, that are getting in our way. And going to the water, and engage in all these rituals that are meant to be to appease the Satan or ward off the Satan are really these symbolic ways of saying to God, there are all these things that are afraid of that I wish wouldn't get in the way. It's very fitting, especially at this time of year, when we when we're talking about the, the books of life and death being open and thinking about a year past and a year ahead, and what are all the fears that we have as we go into this coming year of what might come our way and of whom it is that we might come to be. And it's that fear of all these forces, all these, all these, all these, um, all these hindrances that could get in our way, that might be the satan, the metaphorical satan that we're trying to ward off or distract or appease or bribe. And so maybe that's part of what Tashlich is too. Tashlich, as we discussed uh, when, we, uh, when we started uh, already uh, two weeks ago, Tashlik might be a little bit about um, thinking about sin as a, as a burden and wishing that we could be relieved of that burden. Tashlik might also have all sorts of water connections around uh, eternality and thinking about the meaning of time, the passage of time. And it might have to do with the notion of coronation upon the water. It might be about witnessing um, the greatness of the creator. It might be about, as we saw from the Ein El Yaw, the, the idea of, of coming uh, a code of terms with the place that we come from, our own place in the creation. It might be the Tash that really has a history, a history where it's tied up with the scapegoat, these other rituals where we're trying to ward off or confuse the Satan. But that spiritually for us might be an opportunity to think about what are we afraid of? What are the fears that we face? And how can we look those in the eye as we approach the new year and ask God for help? Say to God that we 
we know that there are all these all these hindrances that we're afraid of that uh that seem to be attempting to overtake us and we we want to do whatever we can to get them out of our way so we can make our way to a meaningful uh, uh holiday experience and to uh, uh, a a heavily blessed year um so i i hope that in the time that we've uh, been able to learn together these past couple of weeks we've seen a uh, a few different ways that we might look at Tashlich through its history um, and these different kinds of these different layers of meaning that we might find within this ritual. And um, it opens up uh, ways of thinking about other kinds of rituals. Where, where might we be able to unpack um, an ancient history to rituals that we observe? Are there additional layers that have been incorporated into a practice with time? And what are the various spiritual valences that we can pick up on um, in these various rituals? Um, uh, I hope that for everybody who's here, I hope the Satan does not get in your way. Um, uh, that the, and that the waters don't overtake us, um, but that we uh, find our way through these various rituals uh, to find meanings that speak to us um, and that we should make our way to a, a really wonderful year. Okay, thank you so much, Rev Matthew, uh, and thank you, uh, thank you for this lovely uh, uh, three. I hope that most of you got to uh, be with us for all three classes. This was wonderful, uh, and thank you, of course, to uh, all of the participants who are um, an important part of our learning community. Um, Dorisha's classes are going on a, a brief break um, in Tishrei, but we will uh, return for Falls Man uh, 2023 on October 10th. So please check our website and also just, uh, you know, uh, look out for classes again starting October 10th. And again, thank you so much, Rav Matthew. Uh, and um, yeah, I wish everyone Gmachatima Tava and Shana Tava Matukai again. And Lehitraot. Uh,